right, you guys ready to get into the God's Word today? We are going to read our Bibles today. Man, it's going to be good. You're going to love it. If you've never done it before, it's going to be a wild experience for you. I mean, there's some good stuff in here. You know, it's funny, when you read the Bible, uh, if we can read the Bible like we've never read it before this morning, how, how amazing would you be? And here's the deal. If you read the Bible, if I were to tell you that everything in here is true, and you believed me, let's just, let's just say, for instance, you believed everything I said today. I'm going to tell you right now, everything in here is true, and we're going to read some stuff and act like you've never read it for the first time. Get ready to have your minds blown today. This is really how we should approach God's Word. It's going to be so good, you are going to love it. Hey, so I'm not Pastor Nate. Pastor Nate and Evan, they are um, enjoying vacation with their family up in Minnesota. Minnesota? Oh, don't you know? Uh, So they're with family this week. Um, So you get me. You get me. Thank you for your enthusiasm. That could have gone one of two ways, and uh, we'll see if that was early in your celebration or not. We'll see. But what I like to do is I like to really ease into it and give you a joke or two to make you think that uh, I'm going to like this today. So we'll see. We'll see if you do. I heard there was a conversation between a a farmer and his horse, which was funny, but like a horse can talk. But the, the farmer said, well, I suppose, yeah, you're a good horse. You're, you're a hard worker. Um, I haven't really had to take you to the vet much. I just kind of wish you would, you you know, plow a little faster. Uh, and the horse said, no, I said feed bag, not feedback. (laughs) Feed bag. He didn't want feedback, feed him. I also heard of, um, uh, this girlfriend, uh, she got her boyfriend this, uh, get better soon card. And she said, he's not sick. I just think he can get better. So, there you go. <laughs> look, look at your neighbor and say, get better. Get better. Be better. Just be better, okay? I know. And one of y'all, one of y'all is going to be dumb enough just to do that. I know. I just know you're going to head to Walmart, get into that Hallmark section, get you a get better card. Love it. Love it. All right. Um... All right, we are going to be talking this morning um, about something that I won't reveal yet. We'll leave you in suspense. Uh, Let's pray and let's ask the Lord for his help because he knows we need it. Okay. Father, we just come to you and we do. We ask you for your help. We thank you that when uh, when we're talking about your word, that you're present there with it. And so we're confident in that, that as we uh, talk about your word, as we read your word this morning, you're present with it. And we just ask, Holy Spirit, You're the author of the word. Teach us this morning. Show us your word. We ask for wisdom and light and revelation on your word this morning and that it does more than just penetrate our minds, but it penetrates our hearts where it it can get sown into our hearts and then produce a harvest in our lives. That's our prayer, and we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So before I go any further, I do want to, uh, uh, I'm a day early, but I want to wish my wife a happy 19th anniversary. This is tomorrow, 19 years. Um, I need to go to the card section myself, so I wanted to do that from here, so I've at least done something, okay? 19 years, that's pretty wild. Uh, Yeah, so over half my, exactly half my life now, I've been married. That's crazy. You're thinking, Landon, you you don't look that old, and I thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, But I was thinking about, I actually asked her this week, uh, I was talking about this message. I said, hey, didn't I, didn't I get you a promise ring? How many of you got a promise ring or gave a promise ring when you were dating? Oh, so not many of us. Wow, okay. So maybe y'all are smarter than us. I don't know. Uh, it'd be a fun question to say, who'd you get a promise ring for that you're not, that, that's, that ship sailed, right? That'd be, that'd be more fun. Because if you think about it, and I did, she said, yeah, you did. It was for my birthday. And I remembered then I got it for her birthday when, I don't know, we were 17 or something like that. And we took a train ride in Van Buren. You know the train in Van Buren you can actually ride on? I don't know if they're still doing that. I didn't know what it was for. They're still doing that. Okay. Well, there you go. Why don't you go get a train ride and you have a promise ring to someone. (laughs) But uh, we did that. and, And so I remember and I was just thinking back, I'm like, you know, it's, it's crazy thinking back now, I'm 38, and I'm thinking, uh, as a 17-year-old, however old, I mean, it could have been 16, I don't know, uh, that I'm giving a promise ring to a girl at that age, and I, 
I, I barely know anything about myself, right? I, or about love or about life. And here I am promising, hey, I know we can't get engaged yet. That, you know, that's not the social standard anymore. We're in high school. We can't do that. But I promise. Here, I'm going to give you this ring. I promise. Me and you, okay? And when you make a promise to someone, it's funny. When you make a promise to someone and you mean it, there is nothing at that time, there's nothing that, that, you, that crosses your mind that thinks there's going to be something that keeps me from fulfilling that promise, right? When you make that promise, you don't think of what could happen. You just know in that moment, this is, this is it, this is what I want, this is what we're going to have. Yeah. Fortunately, that worked out for us. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Um, I won't go into how it, it almost didn't, but I'm just kidding. I like to really condemn her for that, but <laughs> it's an ugly word. No, it's funny. We joke about it. But um, as humans, you know, there's a lot of things that, that could go wrong when you make a promise to someone. There, there are, like, there, we, we just don't think of, of all the things that could happen. Uh, and when someone makes us a promise, uh, one of the things that we, we don't even think about doing this, but this is how we process and this is how quick we process. If someone were to make a promise to me, I am instantly calculating a lot of different things about this person to know if that promise is going to be good or not. Yeah. I'm thinking, uh, what's their character like? What's their motive What's their motive in making this promise to me? Uh, what's their history? Does their, the, does their background check? I mean, all these things, you don't think, I don't think about all that. Yeah, you do. You process all that real quick based on what you know about that person making a promise to you, right? And this is the thing that makes God the ultimate promise keeper because he checks all of those things. He checks all of those things and instantly. And the sad part is a lot of people and many Christians don't know that he checks all those boxes because they base what they think about God on what they've experienced in their life. And this is where we have to, uh, you know, it's not, it's not awesome when someone, you hear from someone else what people think about you. Like, why do people think that about me? Why don't they just listen to what I say about myself, right? Right? I'll, I'll explain myself. Instead, they're, they're taking what someone heard me say, who they, they misquoted what I said, and then they tell another person and it gets uh, watered down even more, and then they think this about me when that was never what I said to begin with. And this has happened to God throughout ages. Yes, right. And so we could go back to the source and we can find out what God's character is, who he is, and, and this is where I go back. If you just if you were just saying, man, everything Landon says today is going to be true, let me tell you, just, let's just end it right here. God is good. God's good. He loves you, and he's for you. Okay? All right, so if you've got to turn off that filter of not everything this guy says is true, go ahead and turn it off now. But that's true right there. God loves you. He's good. He's for you. And you don't got to take my word for it. Why don't you take his word for it? Take his word for it. He is the ultimate promise keeper. He is. Uh, and that's the title of this message today is Promise Keeper. For those of you taking notes, go ahead and write that down, Promise Keeper. And then let's open up to Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to read verse 13 through 18, and I'm actually reading this in the Passion Translation if you want to follow along up here. Hebrews 6, 13 says, Now when God made a promise to Abraham, since there was no one greater than himself, he swore an oath on his own integrity to keep the promise as sure as God exists. Wow. So he said, Have no doubt. I promise to bless you over and over and give you a son and multiply you without measure. So Abraham waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. All right, I want, you, I want you to write this verse down. Write this down. And I want you to replace Abraham's name with your own name. So Landed waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. So Ben waited patiently in faith and succeeded in seeing the promise fulfilled. This is you. This is me. It's very common for people to swear an oath by something greater than themselves, for the oath will confirm their statements and end all dispute. So in the same way, God wanted to end all doubt and confirm it even more forcefully to those who would inherit his promises. His purpose was unchangeable, so God added his vow to the promise. 
So it is impossible for God to lie, for we know that his promise and his vow will never change. Will never change. So God has made a promise to you that is available right now. Say right now. Right now. And he has not, he will not, and here's the best part, he cannot change his mind about it. God cannot, like he is unable to change his mind about it because that is not consistent with his character. If he said it, he'll do it. He'll do it. So I want to talk for the remainder of this service, and we're even going to get into this a little bit more next week too, about God's promises and how we can inherit them. God's promises to us. How many of you are interested in in inheriting and seeing God's promises actually come to pass in your life? More than just hearing about them, more than just knowing about them, actually seeing them come to pass in your life. I'm, I'm interested in that. I'm very interested in that. All right. So uh, we see in, in a lot of these scriptures when you're, when you're reading through and, and you're hearing about Abraham, uh, it's talking about the promise, like singular promise. And so in a lot of these scriptures, it, it talks about this promise. And so what is the promise referring to? This is the easiest Sunday school answer you'll ever, you could, what, what's the Sunday school answer? Jesus. Jesus. The promise is referring to Jesus and his complete work of salvation. This is what the promise is referring to. Let's look in uh, Hebrews 6, 9 through 12. So these are, yeah, just, some, just uh, a little bit back in chapter 6 here. It says, Dear friends, even though we are talking this way, we really don't believe it applies to you. We don't believe what applies to you. Well, in, in, earlier in this chapter, uh, the writer of Hebrews is talking to them, and he's saying, Hey, we, we've been going over the basic teachings of Jesus for a little bit now. And, and we actually, Pastor Nate did a, um, did a series on this, I believe called Fundamentals, not too long ago. I want to turn to Hebrews. If you're in Hebrews 6, stay there. And uh, let's just read just a little bit of it here. I, don't, I won't have it on the screen. I didn't put it up there. But in, earlier in Hebrews 6, he says, let's stop going over the basic teachings about Christ again. Let's go on instead and become mature in our understanding Surely we don't need to start again with the fundamental importance of repenting from evil deeds and placing our faith in God. You don't need further instruction about baptisms, the laying on of hands. How many of you remember these messages? Pastor Nate did a series on all these, the fundamentals, talking about these things. And the writer's saying, we don't want to have to go back to these things. We want to move on and, 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 and and grow in our understanding, right? And he's saying that there are some who haven't. There are some who have abandoned all that. And so when we get to verse 9 here, he's saying, even though we're talking this way, we don't believe it applies to you. I don't believe this applies to you. Listen, we're confident that you're meant for better things, things that come with salvation. Say this with me. Things that come with, things that come with. salvation. salvation. Things that come with salvation. That may, that may sound odd to you because you might think that salvation is one thing. Salvation is Jesus saved me from my sins and I punched my ticket to heaven and now I'll spend eternity with him, right? That's, that is absolutely a part of salvation. But I think we live our lives down here, a lot of us, uh, not realizing that there are actual things that come with salvation. There are things that come with salvation. The word salvation here actually means, means this. Salvation, safety, preservation, deliverance, welfare, prosperity. That's a lot of really good things that come with salvation. So your salvation is more than a ticket to heaven. Aren't you thankful that that's a ticket to heaven? When, when you made Jesus your Lord and you experienced salvation, the Bible says that you were sealed with the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus returns and you are sealed with the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're his. You are his and you are spending eternity with him. But guys, we forfeit so much in this life when we think that's all that salvation is. We forfeit far more than we should be. Far more than we should be. And the thing is, we too often equate our salvation to, to an eternal event, to like an event, right? Oh, when that day comes, boom, here's my ticket at the train station, here's my ticket, this event has happened. This is more than, more than just an eternal event. It's a way of life. It's to change our quality of life here. 
is to change our quality of life. And, and when we talk about eternal salvation, we have got to, to, to kind of re- rethink how we think about salvation and et- eternity. Eternal salvation, something eternal, is not something just in the future. Eternal includes now, yeah, right? right? Eternal includes back then. It includes uh, going forward. But it includes right now. Yeah. So my eternal salvation isn't just for an event to happen in the future. It's for right now. Yeah. For right now. All right, um, and I want to hammer this home with this verse, John 10.10. 10. This should be familiar to you. It says, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come, Jesus said, to give them life and to give them life more abundantly. Life more abundantly. This, this is more than eternal life in the sense of eternity in the sweet by and by. You got John 10.10? 10. If, if we can put, you can find it and put it up because the thief's purpose is to kill, steal, and to destroy, all right? So, and Jesus' purpose is to give you life and life more abundantly. Amen. So I believe that Jesus is saying, uh, my purpose is to give you life right now, right now, eternal life right now, and life more abundantly. Like, I'm, I want to give you eternal life, the Zoe kind of life, the God kind of life right now, and then I want to do that in abundance, okay? Okay? But he's not talking about the sweet by and by because what he con- contrasts this was what, with what the thief's purpose is. His purpose is to steal, kill, and destroy. I got to say, once I'm killed, I don't quite care who's stealing from me. So this isn't just talking about on the other side of eternity. I'm done dead and killed here, apparently. Steal away. He's talking about in this life right now, the thief's purpose in this life is to steal from you, is to try to kill around you and to destroy you. But Jesus' purpose in this life right here and now is to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. Right here, right now, June 25th, 2023, right now. Right now. Somebody say right now. Right now. And I think that there's a tremendous learning curve um, that we as Christians, need, we, need, we need to learn more about this and endeavor to, to live this way uh, when we're talking about uh, eternal life and things of this nature. I think even, even for generals in the faith who you would consider, you know, your Billy Grahams, your Brother Hagans, um, there's so much more to our lives than what we've experienced right now. And this, this is a life of faith. And we're called to live by faith, right? right? We're to live by faith. And so why I say that, there's so much life still to be experienced. I know this, and I'll just talk personally for me. There's so much more that I'm to experience in my life right now that I will never experience unless I live by faith. The truth. Yes. And living by faith means I need to, and I'll get a little bit ahead of myself here, but I need to not, not pay attention to the things that I see. We've talked about this here recently. Not give so much focus and attention to what's happened to me, to what I've seen, to what I've experienced. I need to give my my focus, my heart, my attention to what God's Word says. All right? Because God's Word, Jesus said this. He said, my words are eternal. All this other stuff is going to fade away. Right? Right? The flowers and all these things, but my word is going to last forever. So the only thing in my life that can last forever is what happens to me as a result of God's word. God's word in my life is the only thing that lasts forever. It's the only thing that lasts forever. And living by faith isn't, living by faith, sometimes we think that's an event. I've come up against something. I have this hurdle to cross, and so I'm going to live by faith to get over that. But in reality, we should be living by faith all the time. All the time. And, and living by faith, again, is, is giving our focus and attention to the unseen. This is why it's difficult to do. And this is why even those who you would consider to be, you know, oh, man, the, you're the Billy Grahams or whoever, uh, that it's difficult for even a person like that to do. Why? Because they live in this world having to deal and interface with natural things all the time. Right? And this is where you've probably heard the saying, uh, that person is so uh, heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. When in reality, like, we need to be much more heavenly and eternity minded than we, than we are. Yeah, that's right? right? That's right. Um, and I love what Pastor Bill Johnson says. 
You know, I've said this a few times. He said that there are people who this is hard for them to do because they call it like they see it. They're realists. And he said that people of faith are realists too. They just, they, they base their, their foundation. Um, how does he say that? I don't think I have it here. No, I don't have it here. But do what? Yeah, they're found, people of faith are realists too. Their reality, the foundation of their reality is just a superior reality. That's, that's, it's superior, and, and it just requires a living by faith. Listen, if living by faith was easy, everyone would do it. All of us would do it if it was easy, right? Uh, let's go to Romans chapter 4. We'll pick up here. Romans 4, uh, verses 13 through 16. It says, Clearly, God's promise to give the whole earth to Abraham and his descendants was based not on his obedience to God's law, but on a right relationship with God that comes by faith. God's promise is only for those, or God's, if God's promise is only for those who obey the law, then faith is not necessary and the promise is pointless. For the law always brings punishment on those who try to obey it. The only way to avoid breaking the law is to have no law to break. So the promise is received by faith. Say that with me. The promise is received by faith. It is given as a free gift. And we are all certain to receive it, whether or not we live according to the law of Moses, if we have faith like Abraham's. For Abraham is the father of all who believe. And so I, I, I love this right here. They're contrasting, hey, the, you know, is, is this life? The promise of Abraham, do, do we obtain that by following the law? The law didn't come until hundreds of years after God had already given the promise to Abraham. So that's not what it comes by. It was by faith, the Bible says, by faith. Let's, uh, I want to look to at, at a specific promise that God gave Abraham because it has the word promise in it, and we've heard about this, the promised land, the promised land. So let's look at Genesis chapter 12 when God first mentioned this to him. Genesis 12, verse 1 through 7. It says, The Lord said to Abram, it was Abram at the time, Leave your native country, your relatives, and your father's family, and go to the land that I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you and make you famous, and you will be a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All the families on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram departed as the Lord had instructed, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. He took his wife Sarah, his nephew Lot, and all his wealth, his livestock, and all the people he had taken into his household at Haran, and he headed for the land of Canaan. When they arrived in Canaan, Abram traveled through the land as far as Shechem. Then he set up camp beside uh, the Oak of Moray. At that time, the area was inhabited by the Canaanites. Makes sense. The Canaanites live in Canaan. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your descendants. Listen, I will give this land to your descendants. So this land, this promised land that he promised Abraham, was it even for Abraham? It was for his descendants. It was for Abraham, but it was for his descendants. And Abram built an altar there and dedicated it to the Lord who had appeared to them. So I looked up, like, you've heard this a lot when you're reading through, through the Old Testament, uh, and we talk about the children of Israel. Uh, it's mentioned, I think, about 100, and, the, the promised land is mentioned about 140 times from Genesis to Joshua. Now, it's mentioned other, other times, but the promised land in the context of them obtaining the land is important for us from Genesis to Joshua when the land was actually obtained by them, all right? 140 times. So did the Israelites who inhabited the promised land, did, um, did they have to earn this promise? No, it was given to them. How, how many scriptures have we said, to the land that I am giving you, to the land that I promised your forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, go to the land that I'm giving you, to the land that I'm giving you, to the land that I'm giving you. That's what all these scriptures say, right? Did they have to do anything to receive the promise? See, see here's, where, here's where it gets switched up a little bit. They didn't have to do anything to earn the promise, but did they have to do something to receive the promise? Yes, they had to take the land, right? right? They had to go and take the land. Right. And we know what happened the first time they approached the land to take it. They didn't do it. 
And I don't think we need to rehash this whole story. You've heard it before, but 10 of the spies came back and gave, gave a negative report of the land. The report that they gave should have had nothing to do with what they saw. It should have had everything to do with what they were told from God, right? That's why the Bible called it an evil report. They gave an evil report because they reported on what they saw instead of what I said, right? Joshua and Caleb, we know, gave a good report. They said, no, we can take the land because God said, take the land, take the land. So they did have to take it. How did they have to take the land? By faith, by what God said, by what God said. That's how they had to take the land. So I don't have to earn what's freely given, but I do have to take and receive by faith what has been given. I don't have to earn it, but I do have to take it and receive it by faith if it's been promised to me. All right, this is what we're talking about today. You've heard, it, you've heard this said. It's by grace that you're saved, but it's through faith, right? Let's read this in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Say, walk in them. Walk in them. There were good works that God created for you and I to walk in. The good works, the good works don't lead to salvation. The good works were prepared for you to walk in once you made Jesus your Lord, right? Once you made Jesus your Lord. So see, sometimes we get it backwards. It, it's not works to earn salvation. It's salvation that propels me to do the works that God prepared for me to do before the beginning of time. Are y'all with me this morning? So did God prepare the promised land in advance for his children to walk in? Yeah, it was provided and sourced by grace. The promised land, it was provided, it was, a, it was a good land, a land flowing with milk and honey. It had, it had mountains to protect them from the weather. It had the sea over here. You hear about how fertile uh, and, and the good soil that Israel has today? That's, that's the promised land. That's the good land. It had everything that they needed, everything. And God sourced and provided all of it by grace, by grace. Um. But they didn't walk in it because they didn't exercise faith. They didn't hold to God's word. And this is where it's important for us to, um, to understand how grace and faith work. If, it's, if grace is the source, and this is why you, you may have heard this example before, and we've probably talked about it, but it bears repeating because it's so powerful. Grace is like uh, the, the power plant. Okay, it's the source, right? If the power plant, if there was no power plant, all of this would be dark and we'd have nothing in here right now, right? It's the source. It's sourcing all of this right now. Um, and it's like, uh, give me, let me have this lamp here. I brought this. It's like this outlet up here is my access point for faith. So I've got a promise of God here. I've got what God said, but apart from, uh, apart from accessing this outlet here, this is going to be, this means nothing to me. This is just, this is just God's word sitting in the Bible on my coffee table doing nothing. But when I take God's word, right, I hear what God said and I, I, and I, and I plug it into the source. Come on, source, open up here. That's not it. All, God's being used by all these other plugs right now. <laughs> We gotta find another another access point. Oh, there it is. Hey, guess what? There it is. Look, look, it's by grace, but it's through faith. Right here. See, and a lot of us, we like to just try to, we like to try to just say, oh God, God, I need this. God, I need that. God, I need more money. God, I want this. I want I, I want to date this girl so bad. God, I want this job. And we're, and we're taking something and we're trying to plug it in to God. And it, that's not plugging in. And somehow we get frustrated because we want something from God and God's not working. But what did, did, what did God say? Hey, just whatever you want, just put it in the vending machine and select what you want and I'll give it to you.
I was all, <laughs> upper room up here. Um, that's, not, that's not how God works. If I'm trying to get God's power to flow to anything and everything that I want in my life, the problem isn't and never was the power source, guys. It's what I keep trying to plug into it. I have to plug in something compatible with the source in order to access its power. This is where Romans 10, 17 comes in, and it's so important. Faith comes and only comes by hearing the word of God. I can only get what I need to plug into the source from God's word. This is why you may have never heard a church more just teach on the importance of God's word. Do a daily Bible reading plan. Why? That is the only way that faith will come into your life. It is the one and only way that faith will come. You can never, never without faith access anything from God, ever. It requires faith. It requires faith. And a lot of times we get something from God's word. We say, oh God, that's so good. That's so good. I got your word and I'm going to plug it in. And I'm like, it's not, that didn't work. And I just unplug it. I try to plug it in. It, that didn't work. And this is what we're going to get into. The Bible talks about faith and patience. You got to leave it plugged in. You got to stay there. If God said it, he will do it. If God said it and I do what he said and, and I'm not seeing it working, there, there's, there may be something that I need to tweak on my end here, right? And maybe just, oh, um, hey, you've got ought in your heart. I want you to go and forgive this person because you've got this and, and you're trying to come to me and receive something from me and you're plugging into the source because you've got my word, but you have ought in your heart against another person. And do we not have scripture on this? that says very clearly, no, you go and you take care of that first, and then you come back to me with your prayer. Oh, okay, I'll go forgive that person. Oh, look at that. Look at that. I just got supplied from the source because I did what the Word told me to do. Faith. This is how faith works. Can y'all see that over there? Faith works for y'all over here too, even if you can't see it, okay? All right. If it came from his word, then it is automatically compatible with the source. And I can rest assured that grace will be supplied when I access it through faith. It'll happen. It'll happen. Um, here, I want to, even those examples, what did I throw out there? I talked about like a job. Um, so a lot of times people are like, God, I want this job. I'm believing for this job. And you know what? We should be believing God for good things like that job. Uh, so go to, go to his word and find out what his word says. Well, I don't know if God's word says much about me getting a job. Well, what does it talk about? It talks about uh, in Psalms 92, 13, it says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. So if I'm planted in the house of God, it looks like my life will flourish. If my life is flourishing, that, that probably means that other parts of my life are flourishing and I've got the job that, that I want, or the job that I don't even know about that God has for me that's even better than what I'm thinking about right now, right? So, so what I know to do is maybe I should plant myself in the house of God, and then I'll begin to flourish. Plug that in, and you'll find that what you wanted, you're getting something better than what you wanted. If, if you're saying, God, I need money, I've got this need and that need or whatever, hey, do you know how many scriptures there are on money in here? It's, it's so, I mean, we talked about how many times they mentioned the promised land. Uh, I've looked at the statistics, statistics before. It's a lot. I'll just say it's a lot. There are a lot of scriptures in here on money. You might be familiar with the few. In Malachi 3.10, when God says, bring all the tithes into the storehouse so there will be uh, uh, food in my house. He says, test me in this, says the Lord, and see if I won't throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. Does that sound good to anybody? Yes. That sounds really good to me. What did, he, what did he say to do? Bring all the tithe into the storehouse. What's the storehouse? Where are you fed spiritually? Where your spiritual food is supplied. Bring the tithe into the storehouse. Then what will happen? Whatever God said. God will do what he said he would do. This is your point where you say, oh, God said that. I'm going to do what he said. I'm going to bring all my tithe into the storehouse. And guess what I just accessed? I just accessed the source. 
Instead of now begging or asking God for money, God already told me how I could have that come into my life. He told me that already. He says in Proverbs, a faithful man shall abound with blessing. Oh, okay, I'm going to be faithful then. A faithful man shall abound with blessing. Right? We know our God will supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. Scriptures. I got his word. I've got his word. So I've got what I need. I've got all I need. All right, I want to go back to uh, Romans chapter 4, and we're going to go down to verse 17. So we left off in verse 16 up there. Romans 4, 17 through 24 says, That is what the scriptures mean when God told him, I've made you the father of many nations. This happened because Abraham believed in the God who brings the dead back to life and who creates new things out of nothing. Even when there was no reason for hope, Abraham kept hoping, believing that he would become the father of many nations. For God had said to him, that's how many descendants you will have. And Abraham's faith did not weaken, even though at about 100 years of age, he figured his body was as good as dead. He figured his body was as good as dead, and so was Sarah's womb. I mean, that's, I would have figured the same thing. Y'all would have figured the same thing. Like, so I said, God, look, look, I'm 100, man. I'm 100, she's 90, uh, you got any other plans? You got, can we do this another way? He figured his body was as good as dead. Uh, Abraham never wavered in believing God's promise. In fact, say in fact, he, his faith grew stronger, and in this he brought glory to God. He was fully convinced that God is able to do whatever he promises. He was fully convinced, and because of Abraham's faith, God counted him as righteous, and when God counted him as righteous, it wasn't just for Abraham's benefit, it was recorded for our benefit too, assuring us that God will also count us righteous if we believe in him, the one who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. Aren't you thankful that you are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus because he made you righteous when you believed in him? Thank you, Lord. So again, if living by faith were easy, then everyone would do it. You've got to be like Abraham. We have to be willing to call those things that are not as though they already were. And you've got to be okay with people. And this is why uh, Jesus talks about, look, all these things, these good things that I'm talking about, I want to bring these things into your life. But guess what comes along with them? Persecution. So we've got to be okay with persecution coming from people thinking that we might be weirdos. And I'm not saying be a weirdo. This is not weird. This isn't weird. I think what's weird is how, how much weight we give to the natural stuff yeah. and stuff that we can see. Yeah. That's right. I think that's weird. That's right. should be weird to us. So I'm not saying act like a weirdo. I'm not saying that you're out there in public and out loud, you're just calling all those things that be not as though they were. Like You can do these things without being a weirdo. Jesus wasn't weird. Jesus was cool. Just read the Bible. He was. And so what, what did he, how did he tell us to pray? Our Father uh, in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our prayer should be on earth as it is in heaven. Heaven should be coming to earth. He wants heaven on earth for us. He doesn't want us to cash our ticket at the end of time and move on into heaven. He wants heaven to invade earth long before then. He wants heaven to invade you long before then because heaven is infectious and it can affect others around you right? You need to be infected with heaven. So Abraham did not consider his own body. We did a message a few weeks ago called don't look. Don't look. He didn't look at his body. That's not what he looked at. In fact, it was in 2 Corinthians 4.18. If you put that up, he says, so we don't look. Say, don't look. We don't look at the troubles we can see now. Rather, we fix our gaze on things that cannot be seen, for the things we see now will soon be gone, but the things we cannot see will last forever. So those who live by faith, if I'm going to live by faith, I must become proficient at not caring what it looks like. That's right. I must become proficient at not caring what it looks like. When I see something presented to me that's not favorable or doesn't line up with God's word, I must become proficient at not caring what I'm seeing right now. I have to go back to what does God's word say about this because that's the word I'm going to take and that's what I'm going to live by even though I'm presented with something contrary to it. That's right? right? 
So if we're not experiencing God's promises in our lives, then we need to see if we're actually living by faith or just living on a prayer of faith. Again, living by faith isn't in an event. It's a lifestyle. Yeah. This is a lifestyle. Uh, let's skip down to uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Just a few more, and we're going to wrap up here. Let's read this in the NLT first. It says, uh, one, verse, chapter 1, verse 20, For all of God's promises have been fulfilled in Christ with a resounding yes, and through Christ our amen, which means yes, ascends to God for his glory. In the Amplified it says, For as many as are the promises of God, they all find their yes answer in Christ. For this reason we also utter the amen, or the so be it, to God through him. In his person and by his agency, to the glory of God. So all of God's promises, all the promises that you read about in here, guess what they are? They're, through Jesus, they're yes. Through any other means, they're uh, no. Good luck. But through Jesus, they're yes. And, and they're amen in his name. So I'm to say amen to God concerning all of his promises in Jesus' name. This is why we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In his name and by his agency, be it done unto me. So be it. So be it. This is why we're to pray that way. I love, there's a footnote. Uh, oh, that's actually in this next one here in 2 Corinthians 7. I want to read uh, 2 Corinthians 7, 1. This is out of the Passion. And there's a footnote that I want to read on this. It says, beloved ones, with promises like these. We're talking about promises, aren't we? With promises like these and because of our deepest respect and worship of God, we must remove everything from our lives that contaminates body and spirit and continue to complete the development of holiness within us. Uh, there's a footnote here where it talks about removing these things from our lives, about purifying ourselves, and it says believers today must take an active and disciplined approach. Say active. Say active. An active and disciplined approach to spiritual maturity. This means that this isn't just a weekend event where you come to church and you were active and disciplined in your approach. This isn't just Sunday morning, guys. That's right. That's right. An active and disciplined approach to spiritual maturity and living holy lives. Grace never removes our responsibility to be faithful to God. Grace empowers us to do what pleases God. So there is some do that follows our belief. We need, to have, we need to have this, I do not have to do and work to earn salvation, but there is a do that follows my salvation to live out the good works that God planned for me ahead of time. I'm going to close with this last set of scriptures in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 12. It says, by his divine power, God has given us everything we need for living a godly life. We have received all of this by coming to know him, the one who called us to himself by means of his marvelous glory and excellence. And because of his glory and excellence, he has given us great and precious promises. These promises are the prom these are the promises that enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. I want to read this again. These promises enable you to share his divine nature and escape the world's corruption caused by human desires. The more promises of God that show up in my life, the more I will look like him. This is what this is saying, because they enable me to share his nature. The world wants to see God in us. See, a lot of times as Christians, we're, we're, we're preaching God at people. We have, they have their agenda and we have our agenda. But agendas, shouldn't, our agendas aren't the things that, that are bringing people to God. People want to see God in you. And his promises coming to pass in your life are what enable you to share his divine nature. Why? Because they're his promises. They're his way of life. So when I receive a promise from God in my life, let's just say that there's a promise uh, from God in my life for divine healing. Did you know this? It's God's will to heal. Jesus demonstrated this perfectly in his earthly ministry. It is his will to heal. And because of his finished work on the cross, he took a beating and he took lashes on his back so that I could be healed. 
And so one of God's promises for me is divine healing, meaning that it is possible for me as a believer to walk in divine health where I don't encounter sickness or disease or any time that tries to come on me, it falls off of me, right? Because I, I'm living um, under a covenant with God that Jesus paid the price for that. It's available to me. So when sickness and disease is running rampant in the world, if me and my family are living and sharing in this promise from God of divine healing, we are now looking more like God. And guess who sees that? The world sees that and they're drawn to it because they don't know how you're doing that in this current climate when there's all these things going on in the world. How? How is that happening? Don't just tell them, show them. Show them. Verse five, in view of all this, make every effort to respond to God's promises. Make every effort to respond to God's promises. Supplement your faith with a generous provision of moral excellence, moral excellence with knowledge, knowledge with self-control, self-control with patient endurance, and patient endurance with godliness, godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection and love for everyone. The more you grow like this, the more productive and useful you'll be in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But those who fail to develop in this way, they're short-sighted or blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their old sins. So dear brothers and sisters, work hard to prove that you really are among those God has called and chosen. Do these things and you'll never fall away. Then God will give you a grand entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The idea here is that if we are living a life of faith here on the earth, we should, we're going to be, it's gonna be shock and awe when we arrive in heaven because God's that big and that great, but it'll be more shock and awe for others who weren't having much of heaven on earth. We shouldn't, we shouldn't just be blown away when we see what heaven is like. We were to be experiencing some of that already. Right. Here, now. Right. Verse 12 says, Therefore I will always remind you about these things, even though you already know them and are standing firm in the truth you have been taught. And that was my assignment today, was this scripture right here, was to remind you about these things. You've heard about these things. You know, maybe you've heard about God. Maybe you haven't heard about that God has promises for you right here and now. Maybe you didn't know that salvation included all these better things and wasn't just an event. But if you did, I'm here to remind you about these things so that you can stand firm in the truth you've been taught. So let's stand this morning. And there's a, there's a message outlined a long time ago that I read about when you're preparing something and it's, what do, I want, what do I want you to know? What do I want you to feel? What do I want you to do? And I think that's, that's pretty cool. I mean, there, there's, you gotta lay the foundation of God's word because you need to know something, right? And it's, it's to cause you to feel something in your spirit. But, but sometimes, I don't think we take away what we need to do with what we've heard. And so we're just gonna take you know, one moment here and I want you to think of just one, just one of God's, maybe you're believing for a promise from God in your life right now, that's awesome, you got it. If you're not, um, we talked about some, or maybe there's just a desire in your heart for something. I want you to take that thing and, and if you don't know if that desire in your heart like we talked about earlier is something that lines up with God's word, guess what? You can go to his word and you can find out. You can find out. But I want us to take one thing. I want you to have one thing in your mind and your heart of what God's promised you. And uh, I want you to look at it. I want you to remind him of it. I want you to expect it and don't let up on it. You know, when you leave here, write it down. Write it down. And we're gonna kind of pick this up next week um, talking about how we can see these things come to pass in our lives. Um, but we've gotta stay plugged into the source. We have to stay plugged into the source. Don't walk away from this and uh, today and think there's no, uh, I'm not believing for any of these promises. To, I'm, I'm okay with where my life's at. You, you shouldn't be okay. It, if we're not sharing fully in his divine nature, then we haven't arrived anywhere yet. And there's something that we can attain that we haven't attained yet. Why? It's like our offering confession earlier for other people, for other people. When God's promises are being manifest in my life, 
That's not just for me and mine. That's for others to partake of. That's the whole point. They see God in you that way. So I just want to pray for us this morning. And I want to encourage you to come back next week because, you know, th- this is really cool. This is awesome. This is great. I've accessed God's promise by faith. But if I've heard it and I plug it in and I unplug it, it does me no good. This is why the Bible talks about how, okay, that's hot. This is why, this is why the Bible talks about faith and patience. Faith and patience. Endurance. There's so much that we, that we give up on just because we quit. We quit too early. And there's something that we gotta know about patience and endurance. It's key. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. We're so grateful that you have uh, bestowed upon us great and precious promises. And Father, I just pray for every person in here uh, that you would speak directly to their heart on what is, what is a promise that you've given them that you wanna see in their life right now. Maybe it's a building block to another promise. Father, whatever that is, I just thank you that by your Holy Spirit, you reveal what that is to them so that they can take that, take your word and plug in to you because that's how we have to get it. We thank you that as you give us your word, we have faith to access what you've promised. Lord, I thank you for that. I thank you. I just plead the blood of Jesus over these hearts that the word that was sown, it stays planted and it produces a harvest in our lives today. And Lord, we just thank you for the strength and endurance to continue to live by faith. And for that, we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.